What's up and welcome to a brand new episode of the Disorderly Sports Report podcast. Give us a follow on Twitter at Disorderly Media, Facebook, Disorderly ENT. You can find me on Twitter at Nick Resner, N-I-C-K-R-I-Z-N-E-R. So this week, uh, first of all, I guess I'll introduce the guest first. This is a weird one, kind of fell into my lap. So uh, the guest today, Gavin Garay, he followed me on Instagram. I noticed the blue check mark and I was like, who's this guy? Uh, looked him up and turns out he's in the Mets farm system. So for those who have heard me talk about you know, my, my history of this podcast and whatever, I came from an MMA background. So for four or five years, I was interviewing fighters, coaches, MMA journalists, whatever. And basically, you end up building this Rolodex of guests, right? So I, I have a lot of really solid co- contacts, really interesting people to interview uh, within the MMA world and like tangentially related to the MMA world, right? But all these other sports, which is just a general sports podcast, this is no longer an MMA podcast. All these other sports, I'm starting from scratch, right? So I, I don't... I don't have any sort of build up. That's the hardest part about this is booking guests and, and it's difficult sometimes to mix it up and, and not lean on the MMA context I have and try to branch out. I mean, I did it before with MMA, but now it's a brand new field, brand new, uh, you know, just areas. I don't have any context within these areas. So this is kind of a perfect situation where this fell into my lap and I thought it'd make a really interesting interview. So that's how we got here. And it turns out I, I was right. I think, I mean, I guess you guys can judge, but I thought it was a really interesting interview because I don't know about you guys, but I've been a, a baseball fan. I've been a sports fan for a long time and it's just not really discuss what happens in these minor league systems and and the struggle of trying to make it to the big leagues and realize your dream and you know i think we understand the percentage of people that actually make it into the majors whether it's mlb or or you know the nba or nfl or whatever i understand that the percentage is low but beyond that it really almost puts it in perspective when you look at the minor league system or the the you know, AHL or, you know, whatever it is, all, all these sort of feeder systems before you get to the, the big show, you just look at the number of people involved in these leagues and then what percentage of them is going to make it to the show, you know? So it's very interesting to me uh, to be able to talk to somebody and kind of see where his head's at with everything. How do you stay positive? How do you stay driven? How do you basically separate yourself from the pack and actually give yourself a shot at, at realizing this dream? And I mean, this is great. Like if I ever see this guy playing for the Mets, it's going to be a really cool experience to be like, I talked to him back then, you know? So it's really cool. Um, definitely seems like he has a good approach to the game. His stats are very good. We get into the sort of nitty gritty of all that, but his stats from the 2017 season to the 2018 season are a huge leap up. So it seems like he's making progress. Hopefully he catches the eye of the right guy or, or you know, the opportunity opens itself up for him to progress into bigger and bigger leagues until he finally gets to call up to the actual New York Mets. New York native, it'd be really cool for him. It's just, it's interesting. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I had a lot of fun doing it. No after show this week, by the way. Uh, it just didn't work out scheduling wise. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. I can talk on my own, but it's basically what I'm doing right now. So I just, you know what, I'll, I'll keep it. I'm going to do this, the a few headline topics in this intro, throw to the interview. I'll say a quick Goodbye, but no after show this week, so deal with it. I figured we start with football because football is the dominant sport. I mean, I don't care what you say, unless you like specifically hate it. For the most part, when football is on, everything else takes a back burner. Now, the actual MLB playoffs will trump football for me temporarily just because of where it falls, but you know, at this point, the Red Sox are already probably going to win the AL East. They have the, the chance to clinch in the Bronx, and I'll get into all that in a second, I guess, but the lead story is and will be football pretty much until the Super Bowl and you know I can finally take a break and start thinking about other sports but the big news of today and this is what you get with these these really good uh these intros where I'm doing it like the night before is it difficult because I want to do other stuff the Emmys are on right now Monday Night Football's on right now yeah but what you get is late breaking news and today Monday September 17th was the day that Josh Gordon got traded to the New England Patriots now Will it be a day that's remembered forever? I don't know. It's possible. You know, I think a lot of people are pointing to Randy Moss and being like, oh, it's like Randy Moss. You know, he had some discipline issues, but obviously a freak talent. Uh, the you know the difference in where they are at stages of their career is, is a lot different. Josh Gordon is still relatively young. I, I think he peaked in like 2013 because he's had all the off-the-field issues and, and suspensions and what, whatever. So I understand it's not the exact same situation, but I think that's what a lot of people are doing. It's pointing to the Josh Gordon trade and saying, oh, Randy Moss 2.0. Now, the other flip side of this is that the Patriots aren't the Patriots that they were when Randy Moss got traded to them. They have other issues. Obviously, they just lost to Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a very good team. But the thing that concerned me more, so Jacksonville has great defense, right? The, the thing that concerned me more was the Patriots defense giving up basically whatever Blake Bortles wanted, he, he was accomplishing out there. And that's not good. Now, Blake Bortles, I like him. Seems like a nice guy. He's always been a big barstool guy. I'm a, I'm a barstool guy, so I, I, I like Blake Bortles, right? 
However, uh, he's not an elite passing quarterback, and yet he seemed to be able to pass wherever he wanted to against the Patriots. So while it helps to have Josh Gordon, I think the issue with the Patriots right now is their defense, and I don't see that improving. So they still have issues. Now, don't get me wrong. They're going to win the AFC East, of course, because the AFC East is the worst division ever. Like the Jets, people are, are freaking out because the Jets are competitive this year. doesn't matter. The Bills are probably the worst team in football. The Dolphins, they just don't scare me. You know, they, they have, they're they going to have their ups and downs. But if you're going to tell me that the Patriots don't win the AFC East, then you're either lying to yourself or you don't know what you're talking about. So the Patriots will win that. So they basically have an automatic ticket into the playoffs. It's been that way for the past 10, 15 years. So I'm not too worried about it. It's about it's a matter of, you know, what they can accomplish and build and what sort of synergy they can get going heading into the playoffs because they're going to get into the playoffs, right? So that, that's always a huge leg up anyway. And who knows? This Josh Gordon trade might may, might be a, a big thing. I think it's a smart trade. What do they trade? A fifth-round pick or something? You're not going to get a Josh Gordon in the fifth round next year. you know. So I, I do get that, especially if you're trying to win now. You're not really investing in the future right now. We don't know how many years Tom Brady has left. We don't know how many years Bill Belichick has left. So it's interesting to look at. And it's definitely a big splash trade, too. Like, I get why it's a big story. But I, I'd be interested to see how it pans out. I don't think he's going to be a superstar. I think he's going to be an upper-level guy. But you got to think now, you have him. You get Julian Edelman back, what, week five? So, I mean, the, t- the offense is going to be elite, I think, again. It's just, is that really the biggest issue? I don't know. And speaking of incomplete teams, the Giants and Cowboys played each other Sunday night. Uh, both of them stink. So the Cowboys won, and I'm happy about that. If, for those unfamiliar, I'm a diehard Cowboys fan. It's been a tough 15-year stretch there, uh, or 20 years maybe now. I don't even remember the last Super Bowl. They, they won when I was like four years old, so I've never really experienced Cowboys success, at least to my memory, you know? And uh, yeah, so I they won, and I'm happy about that. It's not, you know, it's, it's better than losing, right? It's a, it's a rivalry game. It's Sunday Night Football, but... I'm not sold at all on the Cowboys' abilities. I think basically what this game showed me was that the Giants are even worse than the shitty Cowboys. That's where I stand on it. It's really not great. It's uh, I'm not very optimistic. I'm still not sold on Dak. I think the defense is good. I'll say that. That's what I said last week, too, and I stand by that. And you know, It's, it's easy to look good against a really suspect offensive line, which is what the Giants have. However, um, I don't know. It's just... It's not going to be a good year. So I think the Giant or the Eagles rather will run away with this again. We have Carson Wentz coming back week three. I think they announced they just announced that. I believe that I think they said it. Uh, that might also be breaking news today. Look at this. You're getting breaking news left and right. Or I guess it's a day old by the time you're listening. But uh, yeah, so I, I think the Eagles will run away with the division. I think the Redskins are terrible. People were like all over them after week one. They are not good. So right now it's all tied up one apiece. Or sorry, the Giants are zero two. Uh, that was not intentional, but I don't hate saying that. But yeah, they, I don't know. I, I think the Eagles are going to run away. It's kind of a wasted division. I don't think the Eagles are going to win another Super Bowl. I don't think they're that good. Uh, but you never know, I guess, because they like similar to the Patriots, they will end up in the playoffs. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. Also, for the first time ever, I believe there's back to back weeks with a tie game. So this time it was the the Vikings and the Packers. Last week it was the Browns and the Steelers. I don't think it's. I I, I want to look up to see if it ever happened in week one and two of a season, but I don't think it's ever happened, period. I think they've never been back-to-back weeks with ties, and obviously it's pretty rare, weird anomaly. Uh, I loved that Packers-Vikings game because I have Stephon Diggs, and I have Devonta Adams, and I have Jimmy Graham, and Vikings defense, which you think the longer that game goes on, it would actually hurt me, but the Vikings defense kept getting sacks on, on Aaron Rodgers, so it was a great game. Basically, my entire fantasy team was all built into one game, and it worked out great. I'm a little nervous right now because Brandon Marshall is going against me. If he scores 24 points, I lose. I know it's a big ask, but I don't know. He's playing his former team. He's Russell Wilson could just like favor him in this game. You never know. So I'm a little bit worried about that, but we'll see. And that'll do it for football talk this week. Obviously, it's only week two. As I said, baseball actually is heating up. There's less than two weeks before the end of the regular season. We pretty much know the playoff picture, right? So you're going to have the Indians and the Red Sox definitely winning their divisions. Probably the Houston Astros too, although it is possible that the Oakland A's catch them. But let's just say Houston wins their division too, right? So then you'll have the Oakland A's versus the New York Yankees in a one-game playoff. That's ridiculous. That's going to be a crazy game. Those are two of the better teams in all of baseball, and they're going to play each other in a one-game playoff. Like, think about that. So that's going to be crazy. Or... It is possible, like I said, that the Astros are in that position. Can you imagine Yankees-Astros one-game playoff for the wild card? I mean, that's got to be one of the best matchups in the entire postseason, and we only get to see it for one game. And one of those elite teams is going to be knocked off, too. That'd be crazy. It's probably going to be the, the Oakland A's, but hey, man, you never know. By the way, Aaron Judge is making his way back. I wasn't sure if that was going to happen. Uh, I actually was positive it wasn't going to happen when 
Andrew McCutcheon got traded to the Yankees. But now you have Andrew McCutcheon. He seems to be doing pretty good with the Yankees. And then obviously Judge coming back in what capacity, how limited will he be? I'm not really sure yet. But that is a huge factor going into this postseason and something that the Yankees have basically been coasting you know, without him for all this time. So to have him back now, what does it do, even from just a momentum perspective, to have your star player back? We kind of saw a similar wave of, of momentum come when Altuve returned to the Astros. So I don't know. It'll be crazy. But going on to the National League, the Braves are really running away with it. They have a six-and-a-half game lead. Granted, these are all sort of skewed stats because a lot of these teams are playing right now. So by the time you listen, it might be a little bit off. But uh, for the most part, the Braves have a six-and-a-half game lead. We're running out of time here. I feel like they'll hold on. The Cubs have a two-and-a-half game lead over the Brewers. However, that's the interesting one because that's the one where the Brewers, Cardinals, uh, and then you know I'll get to it in a second, but one of the NL West teams are all competing for those two wild-card spots. Who's going to get it? I don't know. Who do I think deserves that? Might be a different question, but the Cubs do have a lead. They have a two-and-a-half game lead. You would think at the very least they're safe to get into the postseason, whether they're going to be in the wild-card game or run away with this division. That's something to keep an eye on, I guess. But the Cubs should win this one. Uh, I think the Brewers and the Cardinals are, are the two best teams that aren't currently winning their division. So that'd be interesting, too. Actually, I don't even know if I could say that because the Dodgers are, are doing really well, and they're only a half game behind the Rockies. So it's going to be a real, a real uh, race down the stretch there. Much more interesting, much more... Uh, suspenseful, I guess, than the American League. So I think it's safe to say it'll be the Braves, the Cubs, and the Brewers in the wild card slot, and then some combination of the Rockies, the Dodgers, and the Cardinals. But honestly, that's just a win for the fans. Those are a great squad as well. I think the American League will run away with the World Series. I don't think it's even going to be competitive, really. Like, it'll be an interesting series to watch who gets to the World Series, but I'd be very surprised if whoever comes out of the American League doesn't go all the way. But that's why we play the games. That's why you have to watch. That will wrap it up for this. I will say a brief goodbye at the end after the, the interview, but I'll throw it to the interview now. Gavin Gray, he was drafted by the Mets in 2017, working his way up the system. He's a local kid from New York, and it was great talking to him. So I hope you guys enjoy. You can follow him on Twitter at ggaray5197. That's G-G-A-R-A-Y 5197. Give him a follow. Follow his progress. And that'll do it for me. Enjoy the interview. Here is Gavin Gray. Enjoy. <laughs> Hello. Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing good. So yeah, we just jump right in. So if you're ready, we can uh, we can start. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, cool. Uh, well, I appreciate the time first of all. So I thought this would be an interesting interview because you know whatever we could talk baseball headlines, we could talk about whatever. But I'm really curious about your journey and just the experience of trying to navigate your way to the big leagues and all that because I feel like it is kind of an unexplored topic. I I don't know much about it, so I'll be interested to dive into it. But before we get to that. Let's just start at the beginning. You grew up in New York, right? Is that where you went to high school? Yeah, so I've I've lived in New York my entire life. Dutchess County, New York, which is about an hour north of Manhattan. I went to high school in Westchester County. Okay, and then I assume, obviously, if you're good enough to, to make it and play in college and get drafted by the Mets and all that, did you excel in other sports too, or is it always just about baseball? Um, I was actually hockey baseball my entire life. Played ice hockey. Um, I, I probably could have been – I was probably a better – hockey player but it's definitely a harder um journey to the big to like the nhl and stuff like that it's just a little different but i mean i love baseball more it was just my one true love so i chased baseball instead of hockey yeah it's cool i was gonna ask i feel like a lot of times you get people who are at whatever level like if you're good enough to go pro in one sport you know growing up obviously you play sports in all the different seasons so it's usually split in between you know two or three or whatever so it is interesting to have to make that decision of all right I'm, I'm obviously good enough to pursue one of these professionally but which one do i go into and obviously you chose baseball what is it just difficult because of the whole uh system coming out of america and all that stuff with the nhl yeah i mean not for everybody but i mean a lot of times guys have to take time off of like when they graduate high school, they have to take a year or two, like gap years almost, and play juniors. Right. And then you pursue going into college from there, and then you're older. And the NHL draft, the whole process is just, and there's so many, there's a lot of uh, like European players, Canadian players, just hockey's big all over the world. So it's definitely, it's just, it's definitely a different process, different than like playing basketball or baseball. I mean, it's hard in any sport. I'm not saying it's easier. It's just, it's it's way different. You know what I mean? My brother, who's 24 now, was a bigger hockey player, and he was a very good hockey player. And he went through all that, and I just didn't want to kind of do the same thing, especially when I didn't love it as much, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, it's a grind at this level to, to try to make it into the pros. So if you're not 
you know, head over heels about it or not passionate. It's actually really interesting to see. So you saw your brother go through that firsthand and you kind of got to witness it and, and make that decision of like, all right, I, I saw what he had to go through to try to make it in the NHL. Like, I don't want to do that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, me and him both played uh, baseball and hockey. We played soccer and stuff when we were younger too, just like most younger kids do. Right. But um, yeah, I always had him and me and him would always be playing hockey and like street hockey and and baseball just what we would do and i kind of had him to look up to and kind of guide me get get to see what he did wrong that i could correct and stuff like that so it was almost beneficial to me and he he's how much older he's three years older yeah yeah three years older gotcha gotcha so obviously you, you enjoy playing baseball more than hockey but in general are, are, is baseball like what you consume as a fan too because i feel like a lot of times that doesn't necessarily translate yeah i mean i watch baseball but when i watch baseball now it's more of watching like what the top players in the big leagues do that I could try to do, you know what I mean? Like modeling my game after that. But in terms of just like enjoyment, obviously I enjoy watching baseball. I, lo- I still love watching hockey and I watch the NFL. I watch more of like college basketball than I do the NBA, but I just love sports in general. So I watch basically everything. Yeah, cool. It's interesting because before, so this is a relatively new podcast, but before that I had like an MMA show for four or five years. And that's like a very specific thing where a lot of fighters only consume MMA. They don't bounce around to other sports, but I feel like that doesn't translate. Like most other sports, I feel like you're just a sports fan in general, like me and like whoever else. You you watch everything. It just depends on the season. So it's just interesting that I feel like baseball doesn't necessarily limit you to just baseball. And I think a lot of other sports do that. Yeah, exactly. I agree 100%. So when did you know that playing professionally was a realistic option because obviously every kid who plays you know little league has some thought of it or some dream about like oh i want to play in the big leagues but it, you know 99 percent of the people it doesn't work out when did you know oh shit i'm pretty good and, and can actually make a run at this it was probably going into my sophomore year of, of high school when i uh I, I actually went from public school i transferred to a private school just better baseball better education for me and it was right around then just I started getting in front of scouts and stuff and started hearing what they had to tell me and talking to colleges and whatnot. And that's kind of when I started realizing that I could, I could play professionally. And then from there, I kind of just tried to work as hard as I could and just put all my time into baseball and just try to be the best I could be. And I mean, I'm, like I said, I love doing it. So it was, it was easy for me to, to do that. There's, I have no problem working my ass off if it's going to get me to where my goals are you know what i mean well yeah it definitely makes it easier if it's not like i I think it's almost unbearable if you're in this position where it's like yeah this sucks this sucks this sucks but i'm trying to achieve this goal down the road but if you're enjoying the actual process of of the climb and the journey and all that i feel like that makes it a lot easier to to kind of deal with exactly if you don't if you don't love it like you're never gonna with anything in life if you don't love what you're doing then you're never gonna get to that next step say you're trying to get in the best shape of your life and you're hating it then you're probably gonna quit like you gotta find ways to make it more enjoyable for yourself so you go from you go to st uh, petersburg juco in florida right and then you get drafted by the mets in 2017 uh now we'll get into the the minor league system and the specifics of that because i'm curious about it but just talk to me about that moment that feeling of getting drafted because obviously you said you even switched schools in high school to to try to pursue this so this has been a goal so that moment when you finally get drafted what did that feel like yeah, for me, it was honestly a special feeling because I went to uh, St. John's University my freshman year of college, actually in Queens, and I just didn't, uh, I was promised some things and they and they kind of just never happened that way. No hard feelings or anything, but I actually left and went to St. Petersburg and the manager at St. John's told me that I wasn't, wasn't good enough to play professionally and stuff. So I kind of took that as a, I, I took the criticism well and I tried to literally work as hard as possible so when i when i actually got drafted after my sophomore year of college at st pete it was honestly just unbelievable feeling sitting there with my parents and and telling them that i just been drafted it was it was definitely a special feeling and not to go too deep into this but with with the st john's move then because obviously that's a a big d1 school and then you end up going to the junior college instead and you do that I mean, the way you described it to me as a step forward to kind of pursue the, this career and hopefully get drafted somewhere. But it is a risk too, right? To go from a, a big name school like St. John's and then transfer to St. Petersburg. Were you worried that that risk wouldn't pay off at some point? Um, I mean, it was a hard decision because I was going 24 hours away. I mean, it was a three-hour flight, but it's right. not like I could just 
get home whenever. It was more so just a bigger decision when I made it. But when I got there, I never, it never crossed my mind that I was always trying to stay positive and just always try to pursue. I mean, there was obviously times where you'd be like, oh God, like, did I make the right decision? Stuff like that. But you, you always just keep working hard. And, and for me, it was, I had a great coaching staff at St. Pete and great teammates that, that like always kept me positive and we always were positive to each other. So that, that really helped along the process. Well, that's awesome. And obviously it, it did work out. You did get drafted. That was the goal. Uh, I think I saw somewhere, I don't know if it was Instagram or something, but were you a Yankees fan growing up? Yeah. I, <laughs> that's actually funny. Yeah. I grew up a diehard Yankees fan. My whole family's Yankees fans. So it was actually when I was in little league, my dad was, was like making fun of the Mets for something back in the day. And one of the parents said to my dad, he's like, watch, Gavin's going to get drafted by the Mets one day. And it's kind of funny. <laughs> we saw that guy last week, and he mentioned that to my dad. We were all laughing about it. Yeah, it's amazing. I was going to ask if it's weird to get selected by the other New York team, because I, I feel like it's more of a rivalry on the Mets end, because obviously the Yankees have had much more success. But it's like, I feel like it is a little weird to get, obviously, the odds of you getting drafted by the Yankees, I mean, it's just one of whatever. But it's I, I feel like to get drafted by the other New York team is pretty weird. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> It was it was definitely weird, but at the same time, it was I was extremely excited about it just because I get to represent New York, right? You know, where the place I've lived my whole life, the place I love. So there's no better feeling. Yeah, it's true. And speaking of the Yankees, we got the Red Sox heading to the Bronx. I think tomorrow it's like a afternoon game randomly in the middle of the week. Uh, but the Sox basically have the division wrapped up. The Yankees should make the postseason pretty easily. Where is your confidence at right now? Or I mean, I know you said that you you follow basically individual players now because they're almost colleagues of yours now. But if you are, I'm sure, I'm sure still, the Yankees' blood must still be running in you. So are, are you excited about the postseason? Do you have worries? What are you thinking about the Yankees' chances? Um, I mean, they'll, make, they'll definitely make the playoffs. I think they'll win the wild card game. But there's there's some good teams in, in the American League. You got the you got the Red Sox. You got the Astros. You got the Yankees. Those are those are three extremely good teams. And you can't count out Oakland, too. They got a good team. I mean, I have a feeling it's going to be an American League team that wins it all this year. Yeah. And it, could definitely be the Red Sox with that that lineup and that pitching staff. Yeah, it's a bullpen. That's the, that's the only thing I'm worried about with them. But I think uh, no, I think the the Yankees. I assume that so they'll be in the wild card game. I, I also think they'll probably win it. But that is tough because, like you said, it's it's either going to be the A's or honestly, it could still be the Astros because they're, they're still like on their heels. But I feel like that, the, either one of those teams is a really tough one game playoff out. Exactly. It, it, that, that's the that's the problem with the one game playoff. Right. It could go either way. You you have a bad day, season's over. It's kind of it kind of sucks that that's the format of it. But I guess it, it it definitely makes it exciting at the same time. Yeah, for sure. So your season ended September second, but I think I saw your last game was July twenty seventh. Did you get injured or something? I had trouble kind of finding information on that. Yeah, I had a not necessarily an injury. I was having sinus issues where. I'm still dealing with it, but it's better now. But basically, I had science issues that were causing like blurred vision and stuff like that, and triggering headaches and migraines and stuff like that. But I got it taken care of. So going forward, it, it won't be a problem anymore. But it, it sucked in season. That's for sure. Now it's just time to get ready for next year. Yeah, well, it's good that you're on pace to, to just have a regular return next year. But you also had an abbreviated campaign this year obviously with those issues and, and I think you, you've played in like half the games from the previous year or whatever but with that with basically half the at-bats half the outings all this stuff you showed a ton of improvement you went from a 246 average to 329 your OPS went from 662 to 949 uh, more RBIs a lot less strikeouts what do you attribute that to is it just kind of getting familiar with the the level of competition yeah I would say the the first year too it was, it was definitely mental and, and pressing and I was changing some things in my swing that I never should have where I didn't really trust my abilities. And uh, definitely a huge um, part of my success this year is that the training facility I worked out with, North Star Sports, and the head trainer, Jerry North, who got me in the best shape of my life and um, helped me not just with the physical aspect and the skills, but also with mental, the mental side of the game and just making sure that you're always confident. I think in any sport, when you're at that level, it's basically – because you have the skills, right? You have the physical skills to get there. That's why you're there in the first place. But I think that the mental thing gets overlooked so much where it's, you have the skills. So if you can get that mental part of your, your game, then I feel like that makes the huge difference between separating people from the top level and people who are like just below the top. Exactly. Exactly. It's all, it's all mental in today's game. For sure. And then, you know, with that, not to lean into this, but 
with you improving the game so much and having such a good year this year, how then by comparison, how frustrating is it, you know, to, to hit this wall with the with the sinuses and all that? I mean, it was definitely frustrating, especially since my team was making a playoff push and everything and I I was still trying to attribute as being a positive teammate and stuff like that, but it sucked that I couldn't uh help out actually on the field and, and and play and show what I can do and it's definitely frustrating but at the same time everything happens for a reason and I just got to keep keep moving forward and just keep getting better did you always play first base or is that something that I feel like growing up I assume you play like shortstop or something because I think most of the better players do but yeah I I, uh, I was a shortstop all throughout high school and I played third base then when I got to St. John's we had a kid who was the freshman all-american who was the third who was playing third base and then I, I was I played strictly first base there and then at my junior college I played a little bit of third base but mostly first base and then and, the, and professionally I've been majorly just mostly a first baseman it was an interesting switching sides of the field I mean obviously no, and it's not crazy but I think for a long time you basically only had left-handed first baseman but now it's much more common to have righties yeah I mean it's a, it's a little uh it's it's a weird adjustment but Honestly, it would be harder, I think, going from first base to the other side of the infield just because the other side of the infield is, like, as a shortstop, you have a lot going on. You have to control the whole infield, stuff like that. And as going to first base, it was more just getting the footwork down and stuff like that. And I'm still working on that, obviously. I'm still trying to get to get better on the de- defensive side of things. But, yeah, it was, it was, so it was weird, but nothing too crazy yeah cool so walk me through the the minor league process just because and i apologize i'm not that familiar with it but you're in the appalachian league which is you know, the advanced rookie league you obviously have your a double a triple a levels before the majors but what is the sort of timetable i mean you talked about comparing it to the nhl and how it's tough to get into the nhl what sort of timetable do you expect as a prospect rising through the minors how, how does that sort of work i mean i wouldn't really put a timetable on it because there's been guys that make it up as soon as you know in a year or two and then there's been right. guys that have been in the minor leagues for years upon like years and years and years and and they finally get that call up so it's just like i guess the the better you perform the more you perform like the faster you're going to get moved up but there's also stuff that comes into account like top prospects stuff like that or for all you know you could have a guy in the big leagues that's been a perennial all-star who plays your your position right so you can kind of get stuck behind them so it's just about doing what you can, and for me especially, I'm trying to be able. I'm trying to drop some weight this off season and get in the best shape possible, so that, that I can maybe play some other positions just to open up opportunities elsewhere too. You know what I mean? You always want to be as versatile as possible because it is a process. You know, you want to you want to advance every year, and if you can advance in the like in a year, meaning getting called up mid season stuff like that, then that's definitely huge and you're and you're progressing and you're goal going towards the majors. Yeah, for sure. It makes sense. Obviously more options, more uh, you know, opportunity to, to get that call up. What has the minor league experience been like for you? So you hear all these stories about how it might not be the most glamorous lifestyle at times, but it is obviously a means to the end. I know you've mentioned multiple times that you're enjoying this kind of process of, of, of rising to the top or whatever, but how, how have you been liking the day-to-day life? Honestly, I mean, I mean, I love it. I mean, you wake up, you go to the, you go to the field. Like that's that's what you do. At least where we were in, in Kingsport, Tennessee, um, we'd wake up, grab breakfast, head to the field around noon, and then get all your early work and everything like that in. And then you get your BP, everything, and then they, you go out for stretch. Next thing you know, it's game time. I mean, they they'll feed us after we practice before the game. So after we get all the early work and everything, they'll they'll, they'll feed us, then we'll play the game this post game meal then you're basically just re- repeating that i mean the people the fans in kingsport were awesome so yeah, i was going to ask about that actually because i saw i think the league right below that the other two rookie leagues cuz this is this is considered advanced rookie or something so the other two leagues they said basically are just you know in house no concessions no they're not charging for tickets or anything but the league you're in they do it's like that first one up where they actually have fans that attend you said they're awesome what kind of support do you have from the the local community i mean we had a, we had some uh there's obviously some diehard fans there because where we were it's a small town so people right love when we're in town cuz they get that get that to kind of cheer for i mean it was all positive i i have no complaints um we had all good i guess connections with the fans and Everything was good. We had a we had a good core group of uh, 
fan, so yeah, it's we cool, had no man. complaints. I feel like it's interesting because so I, I live in West Hartford, but they just added the yard goats in a couple of years ago. And like even I mean obviously Hartford's not like a I wouldn't call it a small town but it's also a state where we uh, we just have nothing in Connecticut so people literally I think they sell out like every single game and it's just fun to go to obviously it's not the big leagues but I feel like it is like a fun thing and these these little communities that have these minor league teams I think it actually does have a, a you know a big impact on those towns yeah for sure for sure I mean it gives them something to be excited for when the season comes around so. It's it's definitely good. I mean, the, where I live, there's the there's Dutchess Stadium, which is the home of, home of the Hudson Valley Renegades, which is the New York Penn League affiliate of the Tampa Bay Rays, too. So people definitely get excited for those games as well. Where I'm from, yeah, cool man, it's fun. All right, well, I mean, we'll wrap it up there for today. But obviously, I'd love to have you back and kind of talk about your progress, talk some more baseball or whatever. But best of luck with everything. Hope everything's fine with the, the sinuses and all that going into next year. And I hope obviously you keep progressing up these ranks. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, man. Take it easy. All right, have a good one. Bum, 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 bum. All right, and a big thanks to Gavin Gray. I appreciate the time. You know, he'll, he'll definitely be out in the future as well. We'll follow his his career and his progress through the minors, hopefully into the big leagues one day, playing first base for the New York Mets. Uh, that'll wrap it up. I don't want to do too much of an after show because you guys are probably sick of hearing me talk. Normally, I'll, I'll do these things where I have you know a bunch of friends together. We'll shoot the shit about whatever the topics are and whatever. But I, I covered the breaking news stuff in the beginning. I don't want to go too long just talking about myself. So so this week, we won't do that. But that, that segment is coming back. We're going to do those after shows. Try to work them in every week when we can. Obviously, scheduling is a little tough sometimes. But that'll wrap it up for this one. I will say a quick thing at the end here because I, I wrote this down forgot all about it. Uh, Naomi Osaka, the the tennis player that won the U.S. Open, beating Serena. Obviously, the story became Serena's... Uh, fit that she threw and whether it was justified or sexism and then someone drew a racist cartoon in australia the story was everywhere right osaka just signed a huge adidas deal which obviously is the the big rival of nike so i don't know if that's intentional or not serena's not only a nike athlete but really the face of nike in a lot of ways so osaka signs a huge deal i think i I read somewhere that, that she's like the second or third highest paid female athlete now in the world which is just awesome I'm fully in on Osaka. I love her. I thought it was very endearing how she handled that entire thing. Now, I'm not a tennis person. You probably won't hear me talk about tennis on this podcast again until maybe the next major, but I say maybe. I mean, I might, there's a good chance I don't talk about it then either. I'm not a tennis person, right? But Osaka is such a likable story, such a likable character. She's so young and obviously talented. That was her first major, but you know she's going to win more than that. So I'm fully in on her. I, I She got a new fan after the performance of the U.S. Open, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels that way. So shout out to her. Just want to end it on that. End it on a little happy note. Uh, go Cowboys. Go Red Sox. Thank you guys for listening. Subscribe. Tell a friend. Rate, review. Uh, give us a thumbs up on, on YouTube or wherever you're listening. And honestly, on all those things, because I feel like I just rattle them all off, just tell a friend. This thing's spreading by word of mouth. You have no idea how much of a difference that makes. So that's my number one recommendation. If you like this podcast, tell people about it. Share it on social media. Literally just just mention it to someone next time podcasting comes up. Well, you got to check out the Disorderly Podcast. Check out the Disorderly Sports Report. You know, that's, that's all we really ask. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week. I will see you next week with a brand new episode. But that's it for me. Peace.